What's going on guys? I'm back and I got another exciting interview for you. This time we got Ronnie Smith, Fruity Ronster on Raw Vegan Myths Debunked. No stranger to a little bit of controversy. We're going to get into some maybe possibly controversial subjects. I don't think so. He doesn't think so, but some people do and we want to bring it to you and provide more clarity on really hot topics that uh, can really help you out to thrive with the raw food diet. Both Myself and Ronnie are part of the Ultimate Raw Vegan Bundle. His book, Raw Vegan Myths Debunked, is in the bundle. Over 50 books, $3,200 worth of stuff for only 50 bucks until November 1st. But without further ado, we're inviting Ronnie in here to get into the subject. What's up, Ronnie? Hi, Chris. Yeah, it's very good. How are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I've got my uh, big old smoothie here and chilling out. It's my kitty's first birthday today, so just giving them some treats for their birthday and uh, otherwise just rocking it here on the bundle fun. You? Who's, who's first birthday? Your, your cats? Yeah, yeah. Me and Camilla's uh, two kitties. They're brother and sister, so they were born the same litter a year ago today. So they're our fur babies, so we take it pretty seriously. Very cool. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, congratulations to them. Thank you. Thank you. What's going on with you, man? Where are you at? I'm I'm at home. I live in Glasgow, Scotland, and uh, yeah. So there's a couple of things going on right now. The bundle being probably we'll speak about that a little bit, and and yeah. I'm really glad to have got another book written, which I'm yeah, quite yeah. happy with as part of the bundle. And at the end of this week, we actually have a conference in London, which is our first uh, sort of short conference event, and and that for the Love Fruit Conference and. That's awesome. Yeah, trying to just work out that and 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 get the last few people signed up for that and stuff like that. So, uh, sure. yeah, looking forward to that as that as well, and 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 then preparing for hopefully UK Fruit Fest and maybe some other events next year. Yeah, um, exactly. So, so yeah, want to want to keep on doing you know creating these events if if it, if it works for people. I think that. Um, you know, there's still this sort of COVID pandemic stuff sort of still hanging around. So yeah, yeah. kind of got to be cautious doing stuff, but uh, yeah, just yeah. got to stay present, right? And just do do what we can. And we're blessed that we're able to do these live, live things uh, online and otherwise hopefully live in person will be a lot more. It sounds awesome about the events you've got going on in London. And if, if anyone here doesn't know Ronnie, which uh, you've been under a rock if you if you if you don't know him, but you want to check him out at Fruity Ronster here on uh, Instagram. But also, he's the creator of the UK Fruit Festival. Uh, has it been six years running, or how many years has it been now running? Will this be the sixth you know, year? It's actually eight years. Is it eight? Wow! Yeah, we've cow. ran eight years. Yeah. Wow. So back in two thousand and fourteen was the first time. Yeah. And. We, I mean, we were on this year, we were on last year, so the pandemic didn't stop us from going yeah. ahead with the festival. Um, it was a bit smaller last year. Yeah. So it's it's been difficult kind of a couple of years, and it's it's a weird sort of thing to be doing and be involved in, even at the best of times. Yeah. And then last year was pretty difficult, but yeah, I, and I do the podcast, I do, I've done a lot of interviews with raw vegans that I, that I enjoy. And I think awesome people podcast, like man. Well. love fruit podcasts. Yeah, we have we, you know, it's it's kind of still a still a small thing, but I hope to. I'm what what my goal is, Chris, is I want to have a hundred individually different you different interviews, different people, and yeah. then I'll come back to yourself, Melissa, different people, and we'll we'll have if if you've got the time, we'll have another interview. Um you know, going into some topic in depth or something or, or whatever. I'll have so, to check my calendar, Ronnie, but I think I might be able to pencil you in. <laughs> well, thanks for your support. No, I really appreciate it. And, and um, yeah, we've got some really fun interviews coming up. So I, I, I enjoy that. I mean, I enjoy trying to get this message out. I think it's really important. And huge. huge. It can be difficult because we're fighting a whole huge sort of uh, culture that, yeah. that, yeah. that is you know they, there's um, always people open and interested right i mean they keep coming you know whether it's to live events or whether it's to you know stuff like this or just you know information people are seeking it because the mainstream narrative isn't bringing people to health and wellness you know we, we know it's far from that and 
you know, when you see people like us and other people doing this long term and thriving and doing well and, and sharing the benefits, it, it's definitely attractive, right? So it's, it's getting people getting people on and the stuff you're doing is definitely waking up a lot of people. Yeah, I just feel like I need to do more, to be honest. I, I think I'm absolutely on, this, on board with you. Like sometimes people have this thing of saying, oh, the the, raw beat, the amount of people that are interested in this is quite small. And it's, it's not true. I think the amount yeah. of people that are looking for this kind of solution is actually really way larger than people think, especially yeah, people are looking, looking for health or looking for health information, looking to make changes in their life is a very large amount of people. Yeah. And they would be open to considering, at least considering changing their diet and having more fruits and vegetables and trying a raw vegan diet for a period of time or whatever. And um, the actual raw vegan community, I think, is a, a lot bigger. So I think there's a lot more people. Out there. And, and the funny thing is that everyone says, there's no one that lives near me that, that eats a, a raw vegan diet. And that's never true. Do you know? No, it's totally. just that it's, it's maybe not quite big enough for there to be... Um, for everyone to sort of uh, be dancing in the sun thing. at potlucks every day. <laughs> yeah, like kale chips in every single um, <laughs> grocery store or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. But, you know, that there's. And I just, I just, that message of human beings, the connection we have with fruit, I really like that message. And I want. That's, that's the, the thing I think needs to get out there more and more. And uh, when we think about the history of people, the, the ideas that people ate meat or they um, cooked or food or whatever, and this is what led people to become intelligent and all, yeah. all of this. And uh, I don't really believe that, you know. No, me neither. It seems but, very backwards, you know, because we, we'd be getting way smarter now because we're eating more meat and way more calories than ever. Like, yeah, we ate meat and it gave us extra calories and there's nothing special in meat to give your brain fuel, but we're both friends of Tony yes. Wright. His, his hypothesis and uh, exploration into human brain development and the symbiosis between fruits and humans way more spot on and well thought out. Yeah. And, and, but one of the things I saw as the challenge a little bit of spreading this message and helping people out is, is the fact that sometimes people do it and, and they either kind of do it incorrectly or yeah. they do things that may not work for them. Or sometimes they get ideas from maybe in and around the raw vegan movement that might actually be bad for them in some way. And um, yeah, I wrote. That's why I wanted to write this book, and it was kind of an idea I had. This the raw vegan myths debunked book, but I'm, I'd be interested to know. Do you have any particular myths or kind of misinformation, like and even kind of dangerous information that you see floating around that maybe yeah, discredits? I mean, really, raw vegan? really, Ronnie. You know, I, I think your book is great, and I think it's. Um... You know, it covers a lot of great topics because it goes into 10 major myths. And then you even have an appendix kind of at the back, you know, with other specialty mentioned ones, right? And I think all of them are very important to converse on and to discover. And, and I agree with basically all of them, right? You know, I mean, uh, all of them, I think, uh, are, can, can be quite dangerous and have kind of controversy around them. But realistically, I think they're the really important ones that we need to talk more about, you know, and I mean, from the, the water or dry fasting or, you know, urine drinking or all those ones, I think, are pretty hot topics. Um, but I'm, I'm absolutely down and excited to talk about any of them from your books. I think all of them need more attention. Sure. And, and to yeah, me, I'd leave the ones up to you that you want to discuss here, because I think everyone should read that book. And, you know, it's one of the books, like I said, there's a part of the bundle. And the bundle is not just about recipes. It is also about education and things that can help make make this lifestyle a hell of a lot easier. So you're not like going down these traps, right? Like the detox yeah. the traps and like, there's so many of them, right? So. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think that I, I guess I just get frustrated. Like I made mistakes. So some of you can see I've got a, a, I've got a missing, I've got a tooth cracked here, right? Recently. Yeah. So one of the things that was surrounding and Karen, I spoke to Karen Ramsey about this as well, that, there were people that at one point said, oh, yeah, you don't need to worry about brushing your teeth or looking after your teeth. The, 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 the animals don't. I mean, come on, Ronnie, dude, the animals <laughs> don't do it. It's not even natural. You are so – that's one you're just off base, yeah. dude. We don't need but, to brush your teeth. But you know what? I think you maybe could get away with it if we were living, like, actual sort of uh, natural lifestyle where potentially you're never having any dried fruit. You're never having any 
smoothies, juices, dried nuts, like you're chewing a bunch of leaves. You never have an with dehydration, or you, you know, yeah, yeah. maybe you can get away with it. Yeah, but, and maybe, maybe even too, if we were like five, ten generations before us, before yeah. gener, and even three before all the processed junk that has weakened people. You know, I mean, definitely genetically. <laughs> But that's a, I, I, so I didn't write about teeth in this book. But that's a, a situation that that really harmed me was this this mm. delusion that I got into for a while yeah. that I didn't really need to worry about that. And and on top of that, really, I think the big mistake I believe the mistake for for me personally um, was the dates. Like I ate a lot of yeah. dates, and yeah. I was because I was like really unorganized sometimes. Yeah. So if I ran out of fruit, I would just go and get some dates, right? And sometimes I was just having them all the time. And yeah. I realized later on through a conversation with a dentist and he was, he was explaining a few things to me and I realized that that was one of my huge mistakes. Huge. So, Absolutely. Yeah, like dates, any dried fruit, nuts, anything that's going to stick to your teeth. And then, of course, underripe yes. fruit. Like, and, and I also, I, I, it's so sad to hear, but I, I know some people, I've coached some people who, for example, like, you know, would brush with, with baking soda directly after eating oranges and pineapples and just wore their enamel away, right? And like some pitfalls you can make yeah. with your teeth. And that's that like in a way that's not the worst thing. Like if you can wear your enamel away, it can remineralize to a degree, right? Mm -hmm. um, it can it can remineralize if you then sort of treat it well after that. But yeah. But yeah, um so that's, that's one where I've seen a lot of people move away from raw vegan diet just because of that, because they got cavities. Yeah. And they never had cavities before in their life, you know. Yeah. And yet there was, when I was starting off, there was people that were talking about dates and eating dates all the time. So I made that, that was a big mistake, right? Yeah. But that's an example of what the book <laughs> sort of about. And the, um, I suppose the ones that I wanted to go into were even things that are, some things are spread by raw vegans, yeah. some things are spread about the raw vegan diet, and yeah. I think um, the one that I, the ones that I, in fact all of them, quite a few of them I find quite important. Like the idea of raw vegans, and it kind of all comes from the same area, which is like trying to trying to believe in that like this natural approach kind of cures everything, and yes. we just need to focus on this one idea of go towards what's natural or whatever, and that's it. And uh, probably you've seen, I've seen people that have come to harm by the getting wrapped up in this idea. Something's wrong with them health-wise. Well, I'm going like to fast. I'm going to juice fast. I'm going to drive fast. I'm going to whatever. And it's, it's really sad. It could be really sad because it could... They might not even have anything wrong with them. You know, they just they just feel like they need to get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, oh, know, yeah. and purer and purer and purer. Yeah, so, but that, I mean, and that can, and there's another myth that I'm thinking would pop up there, but like the idea of the raw vegan diet leads to um, eating disorders. And I don't believe that. I believe that there's far more people with eating disorders doing other diets right? <laughs> or been everyone's yeah. been brought up on the, on the cooked food regimen and there's, mil there's so many people with eating disorders and it seems to be coming from that side of things not really from people for sure are... if, if you come into the raw food diet with an eating disorder you may bring it in and i mean i'd honestly yeah. i contend that virtually everyone on the planet has some form of eating disorder like to me um you know it's an eating disorder if you're using food for anything other than nourishment at least to some small degree you know it's just what degree are we talking about and how much is it impacting your health, not only in the short term, but in the long term? Yeah, so the, I mean, th that's one of the first chapters in the book is like, and, and I don't know if people say this out loud, but it's kind of implied sort of like raw vegans don't need medication or can mm -hmm. avoid medication. And I think there's a truth to that to an extent, like, yeah. but you have to understand and become intelligent about that extent, I believe. So yeah. I fully believe that when issues, when uh, health issues are caused by a poor diet, which many are, yeah. if, the, if, the, if the person's health issue is caused by their previous diet, then going raw vegan is going to be probably going to be really good for them. Yeah. And going to be, it can really help them. Um, if they've got a condition that's not caused by their diet, you know, yeah. 
then it will help to an extent, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to recover fully. Yeah. And therefore, other intervention may be required. And sometimes people are getting a bit... I think it's because people have bad experiences with the medical situation, they kind of throw it all out. And they just go, I'm never going back to those guys again, the doctors and everything. And I'm just, I'm now on my, my kind of natural path. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, we need to think a little bit, we need to not be lazy. It's kind of like lazy mm-hmm. to think that. I think, it's, I don't know what you think about that. No, I totally agree. And I think yeah, sometimes either one, some people just think that they're completely invincible and that the answer to everything is just raw food diet. And that kind of goes into what you're talking about before, but it is, it is a whole lifestyle. And then outside of that, yeah, there could be genetic things. There could be environmental things that do damage to you or, you know, or you could just be in an accident. Like for example, for myself, like I, I haven't taken really any medication for a long, long time, but then I got in a motorcycle accident and yeah, I I probably would have died if I wasn't given painkillers and wasn't, you know, put under, under to be uh, operated on and, you know, I was given antibiotics, which I tried to not let them, but it was probably wise that they did because, you know, you don't want to have uh, bacterial infections inside your body. But um, I think there is a time and place for everything. I totally agree. And I've definitely met people who are so opposed to it that they've done themselves harm, whether that's medication or another big myth and topic that you've talked about, too, is uh, supplements. You know, so it's... Uh... Yeah, the, the supplements thing is another thing, and it's... You know, it's one of those things that go both ways in a sense. Like, yeah. like there's people that can neglect that completely, and then there's people that can way go over the board go with that over. stuff. For sure. Um, I agree. And I just think people don't have a good kind of grounding education understanding. And, and the way that I sort of understand supplementation is in, uh, in certain situations, I, I see it more as like a, something in the medical side of things. I... I I just kind of feel like if someone was to say to me, I think I've got a deficiency, I would be saying to them, well, I can't really prove that for you. So you need to go and speak to someone that's like yeah. trained to like test you or whatever and figure that out. And then also, who knows what else is going on in that person's life, their genetics, the state of their body, what they've done in the past, whatever medication they're on now. Yeah. You know, you can't just blanket say, well, just go out and supplement. I just think it's, it's that's all a bit sort of dangerous and um so i think that the, with my, my thing with like the raw vegan diet being deficient and requiring supplements i just feel like and even the vegan diet as well mm-hmm. like it's the way i think about it is it's not really there's there's no more there's no more risk of deficiency from a raw vegan diet and potentially you could say there's a lot less you yeah. know there's a lot less chance Absolutely. of someone but I, I do talk in the book, I do feel like deficiencies are sort of a rare thing and yeah. rare situations. And they're, they're, I think they're much less likely to happen than people think. And what people do get into a mindset of is they're starting off on a raw vegan diet for a few weeks, a few months. They start to feel tired and they start to feel various symptoms. Maybe they're tired. Maybe they're not focusing, whatever it is. And they just immediately start to think, for some reason, the first thought is, is that, have I got a deficiency? Yeah. And I think that, that that shouldn't be the first thought because it's. I think it's a, a, a quite an unusual thing for, to happen to a person in, in the modern world. Yeah. Um, and I do think that the one that vegans are concerned most about is, is B12, but there's a, there's a good awareness about that in the vegan community. Yeah. There's a lot of information. Um, it's very easily sort of avoided and dealt with. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people that go without it for a whole bunch of time and it doesn't really cause any, you know, long term. Yeah. Well, that's the thing too, to like, like true deficiencies are going to take quite a long time unless you're coming into it already deficient, you know, and, and fruits and vegetables are the highest nutrient, highest nutrient per calorie foods on the planet, right? And they're like the most closely mimicking our needs. So, I mean, in order to become deficient on a raw food diet, realistically, either you've got to be under eating food um, vastly under eating calories and or greens um, or have some major absorption issues, which of course can happen, right? Someone can have some something they brought into the diet or they're eating when they're always stressed or they're not sleeping well, so they're not really absorbing well or, you know, they're eating stuff that they're allergic to or sensitive to and causing some kind of malabsorption issue. But I agree too, man. I mean, for my, you'll, you'll love this, I think. Um, for myself, like 
the the vast majority of my uh, for like the vast majority of my first ten years on the raw vegan diet, I mostly just ate standard grocery food, grocery store food, mostly conventional um, in Saskatchewan, Canada, and, you know, throughout the winters, and you know, and I went and got blood tests, and every single biomarker that could be measured was like top notch. Like my doctor was like, "You have the best results I've ever seen." He's like, "I thought you were gonna have." <laughs> Um, deficiencies in protein, deficiencies in calcium, deficiencies in iron. And no, he was like, you literally have the best to the degree that when I go see him now, he's like, I'm not quite raw yet, but I'm doing it. I'm telling clients about it. I my daughter's eating more raw food, you know, and the only thing was B12, you know, like, and that sure. though I, I was checking like from year six to seven to nine to 10, it steadily went in the direction of down. So that's for me, the only thing I supplement. But, uh, you know, I know some people who haven't had to and they do tests, right? And so it's, I think it's intelligent yes. to, to watch those things occasionally. Yeah, and I think that the, the solution that people, uh, the solution that people sometimes put across is the idea of having, of having multivitamins and various products like that. And there's, uh, there's not a lot of good evidence showing that these things are particularly good, apart from if a person did have a deficiency, but there's no reason to assume that you have a deficiency. Like that's, I guess that's my, my sense about it. And the funny thing is the approach to people who are not on a, uh, a supposedly restrictive diet, right? So people who are on a standard diet, when they get sick, they never think they've got a deficiency. No, they never, yeah. ever, ever <laughs> and they're eating crap. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're eating crap. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you were saying that a deficiency can take a long time to um, show up, yes. but the, the, the vitamin deficiencies like, um, C. Vitamin, like vitamin C, mm -hmm. B1, like these would, these would turn up really quick if you, if you were missing them. Yeah, water-soluble ones. Yeah, but it's really hard on a raw vegan diet to go, to go um, low on any of those because they're so, the fruits and vegetables, the fruit in particular, are so high in these, these things so yeah I, I just think the conversation needs to be changed a little bit around that and that really comes from Doug Graham like I, I was I remember Doug Graham saying a lot of this stuff which is like why are we worried about our nutrition it's your neighbor that should be worried they're eating McDonald's 100% hey you yeah. know what Ronnie I'll say I'll be I'll be totally honest here like my first seven years of raw food maybe six years of raw food um, I was confident in it but I still thought about nutrients and I thought about like making sure I'm getting enough and it wasn't that long until after I started the raw advantage that I just kind of had something click. It's like, I like really not just knew it, but to the core is like, I really don't have to worry about food or specifically be trying to eat food for nutrients. I just got to focus on the food I freaking love and get variety and eat my face off. And as soon as I dropped the worry, you know, even though it was slight, it was just in the back of my mind, my, my health and my contentment and my just like everything went up an extra notch. You know, I just felt so much better even. And that, yeah, that's, that's really important, like that confidence. And, you know, I, I just, I would like more people to have that kind of level of confidence rather than having this, like sometimes I have these conversations with people and there's these, these worries they have about, are they getting enough of this? Are they eating enough greens? Are they eating enough of this and that? And, yeah. You know, I, I, um, I, rarely, I rarely hear people say, am I eating enough fruit unless they're, talk, they're worried about their calories or whatever. But, but yeah, well, um, but that's in the book, and I've got a, I've got my own opinion on all that in the book, yeah. and I've I've given references and things that will be interesting to people, and I'd love to get feedback. And if people say, "Well, actually, you're wrong," I'm I'm really open to that, and I'm I'm really interested in us all kind of finding um, where's the as close as we can get to some kind of truth, reality, honesty, like get past our own biases, our own egos about the whole thing, yeah. and um. If something comes out and it's like, oh no, there's no way that humans ever ate this kind of diet, then I would have to accept it. You know, you'd have to go, yeah. oh well, can I enjoy it, but maybe it doesn't work or whatever. But like, but I don't, I don't see that happening, right? Um, but yeah, and, and and well, I guess to 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 move on, the other a few of the other things in the book are some of the practices that are kind of extreme or dangerous. And it's weird because people think the diet in itself is extreme, which yeah. I understand, mm -hmm. but. Um, it's, it takes a, really it takes a while, right, to get to the point where you understand it's really not extreme and it's what, what everyone else is doing is extreme. But yeah. I, I totally agree with you. Like when you're looking in it on the first place, it's like, that's freaking weird. You guys are 
like yeah. taking it too far, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, it, like say, um, it's funny, but even that programming for me, like when I used to watch Doug Graham and when he was giving speeches and stuff, and he would use the word food and he would talk about how eating food and he was talking about fruits and vegetables. And I could, and for me, the word food did not relate to that. It was, it was yeah. weird. Yeah. And he would, say, you know, he would say, isn't it great that we come to the festival and the room smells of real food? Yeah. And I, and I just, it just didn't click for me in my head, that word yet. You know, it was, it was really weird. So you have this kind of program. Um, you hear the I, opposite I wonder, too, right? Like, like people like, oh, like, like I want real food. Like when you serve them like fruit, like they're not used right. to it and they don't even consider that real food. They actually say like, I want, I've heard, I want real food. And it's like, this is the realest food there is, you know? <laughs> Let me ask you, why do you think people go towards, like, I think there's this real attraction to going towards mm -hmm. extremes. So mm -hmm. the raw vegan diet is kind of an extreme in itself, but if you're, if you're actually doing it, you don't see it like that. But some people see it as an extreme, but, people get into it and they go towards these other extremes, mm -hmm. like long water fasts, mm -hmm. other types of fasting, really long sort of maybe mono diets, which I've done a little bit of myself. Yep. Um, yep. And a, a, bunch of, a bunch of other things, like especially like these, sometimes these super long fasts and yep. like things that you're kind of tinkering with the borderline of like, this is actually going to get kind of dangerous if people uh, go a bit too far. What, what do you yeah. think it is in people that makes them go towards that? I think it can be a number of things, you know, like, I mean, in some cases it just might be that they're looking for the quickest fix possible. They're just like, they don't accept where they are and they want to do something that is abrupt and will get them to where they believe they need to be or feel like is going to like take them to, to their success, to their goals, to whatever it is. Right. And, you know, the reality is it takes a long time to get to a place of ill health. And in most cases, it takes quite a while to get out of it completely. And, you know, slow and steady isn't quite as attractive and isn't quite as appealing as like, boom, do this and you're going to get it like bad, so powerful. You know, it's like, it's that kind of uh, sell on just like amazing, quick, like powerful, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that. Yeah, you're totally right. I, and I've, I feel like something I try and say to people is like, consider what you want to do long term or what you're prepared to do long term. That's what you should work on. Not like, can you do a 30 day juice fast or can you do a 40 day water fast or can you do like some kind of extreme thing? Like, figure out what you'd be comfortable with doing the rest of your, your life. That's really the goal. That's the art of it. Like, yeah, get the yeah. lifestyle that's healthy for you that works, and uh, yeah, I think that the on and off. But this, like I mentioned in the book, um, urine therapy as well, dry fasting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people get into these things, and I don't. Urine therapy, I think, is kind of like just the. I think it's like a little bit of a pointless thing to do. I just don't think it's, it does anything. Yeah. Um, Dry fasting, it feels like super dangerous thing to do. And I really it's hate the fact yeah, I agree. Some people are promoting this thing like all like a lot heavy and not particularly people I follow so much, but sometimes I come across posts and there's a there's a community out there that are really promoting that stuff really heavy and mm -hmm. and then there's the breatharianism, which is another kind of strange thing that and all of these things i would say they're not really taught in the raw vegan community that much or say at woodstock you know i've really been taught well actually apart from the dry in a little bit um but a bunch of other stuff but it's kind of always surrounded it's like on the edge it's like always kind of around and you will get the odd person at a festival who's like into breatharianism and yeah you know have done the dry fasting and all that stuff. And uh, what, what's your thoughts on some of those practices? Do, do you have any experience with them or any experience with people that have been doing them? Yeah, no, for sure. I, I have a good friend who has done urine therapy for like 15 years, probably like almost every day. Um, and I've read the books, like I've read the books that are supposed to be the most credible. And it was interesting enough that I tried it for about a week, you know, and it tasted like green tea until I actually decided I was going to do a fast and still continue doing that. This was like seven years ago, maybe eight years ago. And uh, I was just going to do a short fast, just a couple of days, just to kind of reset my system. I was a little more into fasting. I don't think I fasted since then. But um, yeah, the first or second day of the fast, when I tried my tea, it was so horrible that I'd actually gag when just going to the bathroom for about a week and a half afterwards. Um, <laughs> 
and also just even from there like intuitively to me it's 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 on some level repulsive like for anyone um you know i i do also believe that it's, it's going out for a reason you know we can get our nourishment from other stuff and i understand why some people are attracted to it because some books and information promises like superpowers basically and like deeper intuition intuitive kind of powers and you know there are apparently monoatomic yes. elements in it and stuff like that but it, to me i mean yeah it, it doesn't it doesn't spell truth to me and the people that i know who do it long term don't float or have special powers that to me are like okay well that was worth it i'm gonna be doing that myself right so it's not something that i'm interested in um we both know the yes. same person who had major trouble potentially because of dry fasting and to me again that's another one dry fasting it just intuitively doesn't make any sense and learning from Doug such as you have as well um and and from other sources as well i understand that the body does require a certain level of hydration for efficient detoxification so by dehydrating ourselves we're not really doing anything other than stressing our organs and stressing our body um and hindering detoxification realistically uh, i can understand why people might be attracted to it because it creates a hell of a lot of heat in the body um and it creates some physical sensations that can almost lead you to feeling high and deeper connection but that's just cuz you're stressing your body out right it's not because it's a good thing so i i i'm much more for the slow and steady approach you know mostly when i mm-hmm. talk to people it's more along the lines of like kind of like we said like get the lifestyle under control understand how to create sufficiency and uh, clarity in a long term balanced lifestyle and if after a year or so there's still some lingering issues that you just can't seem to nip in the bud yeah then maybe consider a fast or maybe consider some simpler approaches of you know just like no fat no over fat for a week or two or three you know and stuff like that but i'm much more about lifestyle rather than short term protocol what what do you, so now i didn't really i didn't really talk about water fasting like in the book like and and i'm like i i think that when i when i got into this i um dug was a big teacher of mine a bunch of other people and it seemed like a lot of people talk about water fasting and had done one and had good experiences and i think yeah. you've done water fasting and things yeah. and i do support it i think it is good for certain situations i'm not really sure how i used to be quite interested in doing a long one at some point now i'm not sure i'm not sure if i really need it want it it will give a big benefit i don't know but i certainly see people go overboard with the fasting and also do it on the road and it makes me question whether whether i should really promote it at all you know or or, or yeah. but what's your thoughts on fasting like you got more experience of it than me but well yeah i've i've done various fasts ranging from like i've done multiple just like 1 to 3 days and that's kind of how i started like 8 19 years ago before even i went raw vegan i did some short short term water fasts like 1 to 3 days and then i went up to like 7 days and 8 days and then the longest i ever did wasn't super long it was only 11 days uh with some supervision the others i didn't and I mean I did see some benefits to most of them but some of them I didn't break it as smoothly as possible which is one of the biggest kind of hindrances to getting the best out of a fast is is the refeed after and and yeah. in most cases actually the refeeding is the hardest part for anyone especially if they don't know what's going on don't have some support or well educated uh view on it right but yeah. um you know for the most part Ronnie like like I said I'm I'm much more about lifestyle I'm much more about creating uh long term lifestyle changes and i do think that fasting absolutely can have a time in its place uh, i think it's incredibly powerful um but i think it is often vastly over promoted and overdone and that not everyone needs it um for the most part i think if so if people are just taking again that slow and steady approach and you know doing the lifestyle then they're going to be great they're living in a way that they don't require fasting but if after a year two years on the lifestyle they still have some lingering issues or if they're coming from a place that they're severely ill and they have the ability to have like hands on support and be in a really good place then it can be really beneficial but to me the key is the most key indicator for if you're a candidate for a fast is if it's starting to become body initiated if you like literally have no interest in food um yes. and you're just actually driven to it the same as an animal would you know like animals do fast in nature but they don't go okay next month I'm going to do it they just they broke their leg or they got poisoned or something happened they're like okay i'm not going to eat you know and sometimes that's just a day sometimes that's two days but uh, longer term supervised fast i think can be beneficial for like major chronic conditions that aren't healed with long term uh, just sound raw food lifestyle 
Yeah, but and it's hard for me. Like I know a few guys that have been really strict, hundred percent raw, like total natural hygiene diet for long, long periods of time. They mm -hmm. still felt they got benefit from the fast, right? So I understand yeah. that. And then yeah. there's other guys that I know that they probably didn't weren't that strict with their diet side of things. But for example, I know a guy that had a, a type of arthritis that he'd had from a young age. He did a long water fast, and it was the first time he was pain free, like two yeah. weeks into it or something. And it shows like the amount of, like how deep that had to go in a sense, and how far he had to go into a fast for that for his body to be able to deal with that. So, yeah, I definitely think the situations. I I I felt like I saw too many people at one point, and I was thinking, like. I feel like a lot of people were going into it. Maybe weight loss was a bit of a motivation, which I feel is a bad motivation to fast. Yeah, yeah, deeper um, is probably more beneficial. You know, one thing though, too, Ronnie. I apologize to interrupt. Is for those stories, there are also the other ones where you know some people's digestion never really came back to where it was before, or you know, right. their, their relationship with food was a little bit changed, and they're always kind of chasing the dragon, as they say. You know, like always looking to be lighter and. Um, you know, myself, yeah. even I can say, I mean, I only fasted 11 days, but I actually don't feel like my core strength has ever gotten back to as strong as it was before my fast. And mine was only 11 days, you know, so, Whoa. you know, there are, there are certain things about it that I, I'm not like, that's why myself, like I'm not an anti-fast by any means. I think it's very powerful yeah. and can be very beneficial. Um, but it's not something that I think everyone needs to do. So that's just my opinion. I've never heard anyone say that, actually, that they felt they never quite got their, their entire strength. But, but I know that people take a long time to adjust. And I've, I've known people that, you know, they didn't feel it was an entirely positive thing afterwards. And I, I, I think that if you, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I feel like I want to research it a little bit more, learn a bit more about it and yeah. see if I could figure out anything. But, uh, yeah, um, the, one th there's, the other thing, I, you kind of picked up on this, but, I talk about in the book as well, like maybe, I don't know if you disagree or agree with this one, but like the going raw in the tropics or in some place that's maybe warm and tropical is easier than, uh, maybe easier, better and so on than being in a place like you are in Sweden or Canada where you lived or the US you spent a lot of time. Mm. Um, and I personally feel pretty comfortable doing this diet wherever I am really and, it, and it's I'm so I'm used to doing it in a country like this yeah or yeah. like Canada or the US so it's kind of familiar to me to just do it in that environment yeah. and going to the tropics it can you know you have to learn about the how, how you know the, the the places you need to buy the stuff and what you can get and what's available and it's different seasonal and everything but what do you think about that? Like, the, I, like this is always a thing that people say, like, oh, I can't right. stick to this diet because I don't live in the tropics, you know? Uh, yeah, honestly, I think that's just a case that the grass is always greener on the other side. And <clears throat> one of those realities, too, that, you know, no matter where you are, here you are and you have your shit with you. You know, it's like there's always hangups. There's always things that can get in your way. And the reality is, the reality is what you make it. Um, myself, for example... I don't think it's any easier in the tropics necessarily. Yeah, it's a little bit warmer and more comfortable in some ways, but, um, and yeah, for sure, like if you're getting good quality fruit where you are, you know, the, not all tropics immediately have all great quality fruit available everywhere year round. Um, it can be really slim pickings in some seasons and depending on where you are, you know, but if you can get good quality, awesome local tropical fruit, it can be top notch, like picking it off the tree. But the thing is they have a lot less imported fruit as well. So the variety is a lot less. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't find it any different myself personally, very truthfully, I would rather live like somewhere like Sweden, uh, Canada or the States than the tropics year round. I, I'm when I was, when I was first into the raw food diet, I thought like, Oh, I gotta live in the tropics and be in the trees and planting my own trees. And I feel like I'm in the garden of Eden, wherever I am, as long as there's decent quality grocery stores, and in fact, I get way more variety and I still get great quality food where I am. So I, for myself, I'd rather travel to the tropics and do vacations and then live somewhere that's either temperate or subtropical. Um, and I've lived in you know, like minus 40 Canada weather in, you know, medium sized cities and done great on the raw food diet. So to me, it is, it's just that the grass is always greener on the other side and people create excuses. Yeah. 
And part of those excuses are just because they actually don't know better and they really believe that it will be better there. Yeah. But I also know people who have went to the tropics and they were, they were established raw foodists before they went to the tropics and they started eating cooked food in the tropics, right? So it's like, it isn't always easier in those places. Yeah, for sure. I think that like, and, and, and I mean, even just the fact that if you go to the tropics, it's full of like really warm, really boiled, like, like everything cooked yeah. food, boiled in oil, like barbecues, like all the street foods, like well, you can see how hot it all is. And um, I think you're right in terms of that sometimes people just don't know better because when I was sort of first watching people who were uh, talking about this lifestyle, they seemed to be making out that the fruit in the tropics was just so much better. You know, it was yeah. just so much sweeter. It was so much different, more nutri nutrition and whatever. And so when I went to Thailand the first time, I was like, I can't wait for this. Yeah. And I went to Thailand and I realized that bananas tasted like bananas. Yeah. And yeah. the pineapple, you know, and it was like some of it was better, some of it was kind of the same. Yeah. And it was it's great to be able to get things like durian and things like that. But you get, it's just like, we all have that nature of like, we get used to things so quickly, yeah. you know, and it's no longer like a special thing. And then you're like, oh, I miss strawberries. Like, yeah. I've not seen this. Oh, man. <laughs> You know, when I'm in Costa Rica for three months, I start I start really actually missing dates and like I'm really excited for cherry season and I'm you know like all the stuff that I can get back home and it uh, it is it is just one of those things I, I really I really do think that you know like yeah people know. think that I'm always, people people think that I'm lying like they they can't no. believe it when I say I would just be as happy doing it anywhere like in the UK yeah. and. It's, it's funny because there was there was a raw vegan forum that had loads of people on it, and I kind of I didn't get thrown out of it, but I left it because I was and I was always arguing with the person that ran this group, and there was people from the UK that were saying I can't do this diet here, the fruit yeah. food isn't good enough, yeah. and I would just come on and say I'm getting the same fruit from the same place as you are, you can do this, and the the moderator of the forum would be like you can't, you need to stop doing that, stop. Attacking people, stop like blaming stop empowering them. Empowering people to live where they are. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it they gotta like, come to my center. <laughs> yeah, because they were like, oh, there, there's no way that they, uh, you know, they're not they're not going to the same shops as you. Not, I'm saying it, it's the same places. Like I've been all over the country. It's the same yeah. brands. It's the same supermarkets. It's the same yeah. stuff. It's it's such a small country that it, everything's the same all over, really. And um, you know, and and. People just don't quite believe it, you know. And uh, but no, I, I I go to the, and I I also think that there's people that starting off don't really know how to pick good fruit, and yes. they're oh, going yeah. and they pick up stuff that's probably we would probably go that's not going to ripen, that's probably not going to taste good, that doesn't that's not a good variety, yeah. or whatever. And we wouldn't pick, we would just instinctively not pick it up, and they would maybe pick up a bunch of this stuff rock hard mangoes and stuff they go all brown on the inside yes. and definitely, oh you can't do this here so i understand from that perspective you know for sure but, and you know you know ronnie something else i think there's another layer of that when when you first start with this diet a lot of the times because food is a source of happiness and and oftentimes when people are letting go of their favorite foods they're looking to fruit to be their happiness again and if they're not getting the best quality fruit then they're bummed out and it's like once you've done this lifestyle for a while and you really recognize it's, it's just food, it's great, it tastes amazing, but it's just food and you're happy because of your, you're enjoying life, well then it doesn't matter if you have a couple of days that isn't the best food you've ever had in your life. And, and even still, man, like I, the banana thing is so funny because like, yeah, like when I go to Tropic, yeah, bananas are great. And like, I love the bananas out there, but I love my Cavendish, every single country I've ever been around the world easily as much as the general bananas out there. I will say, though, like if I can get good quality apple bananas like in Hawaii or something, yeah, I like those even more. And there are certain varieties that don't ship well, which are a treat to be in the tropics. But, yeah, cherries are a treat when you're in, you know, in the places that they do grow and they don't ship them out to Costa Rica very much or to Hawaii as much, right? So it's like everything has its place. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that it's, um, yeah, absolutely. Everything... Uh, every place has its little benefits and its little drawbacks. And yeah. um, I think you need to be, as long as you're used to living in the place, I think that's one thing as well. Like I went to Mexico before Woodstock. I was not used to living there. And I got like some kind of heat stroke or something. I was just 
I was melting in the sun, right? And yeah. it, it was really unpleasant. Yeah. So, and that's, and the thing is, the tropics is not, and, and people go on about our natural environment. It's like, well, we wouldn't have been out under the blazing sun. Like, it's not like <laughs> we would have been at the beach. Yeah. Like, it's not exactly, like, who knows exactly what the natural environment would have looked like, but probably we wouldn't have been in direct sunlight all day long. And, yeah. you know, this, this, <clears throat> so there's things like, like that, but, um, I, I just I feel like long-term raw vegans often have the same feelings about these things. Like if you say to them, "Well, would you prefer to do it here or there?" Maybe people, maybe some people prefer the tropics, but they don't have any worry with being in the U.S., in the U.K., in uh, Sweden, in any. Like I literally would not have any concern mm -hmm. doing the diet. Like virtually any country, maybe there's some like really super poor countries that don't have much fruit, but I think that's rare. You know, I think it's really or, super rare. Or small, like um, small towns. It can be tougher if you just have one grocery store and it doesn't get awesome stuff. Yeah. But but even still, you know, you get to know your produce manager and you see if they if you can look at their order sheets and order much more stuff in, right? Or or if you have a little bit of extra, then you can order it from specialty people, whether that's date people or like Miami fruit, you know, stuff like that. But it's it's definitely doable, man. I mean, yeah, people think, think that, reasons to make it hard. You know, that's that's a big thing. Well, the thing that the the, <clears throat> the other thing is that I've I've known some people. They say I, I struggled with the raw vegan diet because I could only do it when I had like all the snacks and the amazing yeah. fruits and stuff like that. What what do you eat? And and I would say, well, well, what about bananas and they'd be like i don't like bananas well what about apples i don't like apples well what about grapes well i don't really like them and you're like you can't you can't just you gotta like diversify what you like a little bit yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. like, you and, gotta develop a taste for certain things that might be more common yeah yeah some, sometimes people don't really know what they like because they've had it in such limited amounts and also your physiology changes like you know, if where you are when you're just entering to the diet to where you are a year later, your palate can completely change and the way your body responds to certain things can completely change. So I think it is invaluable to be open to try things, even things you're not sure if you like or you already have a formed opinion on, to, to try them again a couple of times. It's like it's like you meet somebody and, and maybe you don't agree with their stance and what they're doing. You think they're weird. But then a year later, your stance has changed. And when you meet them, you're like, wow, we're actually got a lot more in common. We're friends now, you know, like. That's how it can be with foods, I think, as well. Yeah, and um, I've got a bit. I got. I've got to jump off in about five minutes. I've got me another. Me too. Me uh, too. I'm, I'm yeah. joining a uh, nice cream king next. Yeah, I'm speaking to him later. I think he might have been watching us a little bit earlier. I on. saw. I saw Nate in here too. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So. Well, I think. I think it's. I think we've covered a lot of stuff. I think that. Um, the raw vegan bundle very quickly, right? We'll talk about it. And yeah. this is the second time that you and Melissa have done it. And I'm really honored to have been asked. I'm really, uh, really glad to have been asked to be part of it. And I'm um, happy, brother. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm always, I'm always I, stoked to be asked to come to UK, you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really want to create more stuff and, and work more together and do more things. And I, I, I love being around the whole community. I love being around this message. I really want to spend more time being involved and being around people. And uh, what well, shows you have Fruity Friday every Friday, right? That's another thing that people can join community and connect with. And... Yeah, yeah. The, like I, I, I try and experiment with these things, and I, I see what works. I think the thing I really love the most is, is trying to create like these live events, and um, and that's something that I really love. And uh, so I want that. I hopefully, want that to continue, but it can be like a struggle as well doing that. Um, but yeah, the raw vegan bundle. I think if I started off, when I started off, if this, it, if someone that I'd been following had had recommended this, I would have just thought this is really fantastic and really uh, will help me out a lot. I mean, I was watching like the various speakers from Woodstock, yourself, Harley, Doug Graham. If the, if a bundle had come together with all you guys, then like I would no have definitely jumped. In. Yeah, yeah, totally. And um, so I see it has been so much value to to people. And uh, I'm only really getting into the recipes now, funnily enough. You know, I've never, I've <laughs> always like, I have like a few kind of semi-good recipes that I use, but I started to use these bundle recipes more. 
and go back and refer to it and look at them. And, and I really enjoy getting a good recipe and following it properly and following it to the letter. It's like, this is yes. so much better, so much better. Like, you know, I have this, cause I tried to do a recipe one time for a friend and it just, just it was okay. Do you know what I mean? It was okay. Yes. Whereas I follow one of your recipes or one of Melissa's recipes and I get a really good result every time. So, well, you know, I you really know, Ronnie, some people are gifted to be able to sing amazingly and other people are gifted to chop things up and blend them really nice, you know? So we, we all share our <laughs> gifts and it, it makes the world go round. Let me ask you one last question then. With yeah. creating your recipes, do you like try something, then tweak, try it again, try it again? Or do you kind of, by this point, do you sort of know what's going to work or is there a lot of experimentation and like, um, doing it a bunch of different times do you start off with the base and then s s gradually add things in and see what's working because sometimes I see like so many different steps and spices I'm thinking wow there's a lot of work and thought that's gone into the, all these combinations you know you know Ronnie after a few years of uh, urine therapy it just beams into your mind <laughs> <laughs> no I'm joking but um, obviously no yeah uh, without without seeming pompous very truthfully a lot of the times i just think of it and the first time i make it or the second time i make it with a slight tweet it's enough to put on a book you know but a lot of the recipes that i have also i have made dozens of times um but i think it's just one of those things kind of like i said like some people are a little bit more naturally inclined to be able to orchestrate flavors and match and pair things and of course it's learned but also some people i think are just a little more intuitive with it I'm a little bit of both because I've been making food for a long period of time. Um, but most of the time it is just like, Oh, this was, this sounds good. Or I also have thought of and look at like a cooked recipe and kind of imagine like, okay, well that could be substituted for this. This could be substituted for this and to have a good idea of ratios, you know? And so for the most part, it's pretty quick, but, um, but I love to make it a bunch of times to see if I can tweak it exactly how I want it. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks a lot, Chris. And we should just tell everyone about the bundle and yeah. go and check the bundle uh, through one of our profiles. Yeah. And it's only available till Monday and it's exclusive. And it's the only time it'll be on offer and it's brand new books and uh, really cool. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone will really enjoy it and definitely go there as well. Uh, just to check out the live schedule, both Ronnie and I have a bunch more lives, a bunch more subjects that I think can help you guys out. So if you aren't following Ronnie, go to Brie Ronster right now, check it out, grab the bundle for him. And thanks, Ronnie, for being a part, brother, and for uh, challenging people and, and bringing up these controversial subjects. I, I think you like to do it, uh, which is awesome. And also, uh, I think you're really good at it and also good at just bringing people together and, you know, really, really celebrating similarities as well. So it's a, a beautiful thing. I think you bring a lot to the community. And thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for uh Ask me to be part of it. And I'll see you soon, Chris. Thank you very much. Sounds good, brother. Have a good one. Raw Vegan Myths Debunked by Ronnie Smith. Grab your free raw recipe app, available on iPhone and Android with over 100 free raw recipes, common fruit and vegetable calorie breakdown, frickin' raw some food combining chart, shopping cart function, and so much more.